Hello everyone, welcome. Karibu to the second day of the South Africa Summit 2022. It is great to see all of you back here today after a very insightful day yesterday. We hope you had time to make new connections and reconnect with old ones. We also hope you are able to attend our very informative sessions and learn what other stakeholders are doing. In case you missed any of the sessions, worry not. Please go to our YouTube channel where all the session recordings have been uploaded. We gathered a lot of insights from our morning plenary titled Impact Investing Out of the Margins and Into the Mainstream. The panelists shared some great quotes that have stuck with us. We were reminded that impact is a paradigm shift. It needs to be inten intentional and it needs to be strategic. Africa is not in the business of building back better. Africa is in the business of building. The plenary ended with an optimistic remark that one day all investments will be impact investments and all capital providers will allocate capital based on the three dimensions of risk, economic return and impact. We also had another plenary in the evening that explored the challenges and opportunities for youth development in Africa and how Africa's next generation is driving change. The panelists reminded us that the solutions for challenges facing the African youth lie with the African youth. The youth that need to be the change makers and lead from the front to drive sustainable change in the continent. Before we get to a very interesting plenary today, I'd like to share some numbers on how we engage with people online. It's great to see um, quite a lot of interactions with about 200, uh, about 20,000 um, interactions through our Sun, through our Sun Health, um LinkedIn, Facebook, and 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 uh, Twitter uh, profiles. We also got about um, 27.9 million impressions, about 15,000 shares of our posts, and and people sharing quotes from the sessions they attended. So keep engaging us online. Today's plenary. Getting to Nature Positive through local communities seeks to look at the importance of grassroots individuals and local communities that are tackling climate change on the front lines across the continent. I will now hand over to our very lovely moderator, Fiona Mudoni, to introduce the session and the panelists. Fiona is a senior producer and an anchor on CNBS Africa's flagship market show, Power Lunch East Africa. She is passionate about improving sustainable development outcomes in Africa and is interested in finance, technology, business, women and youth empowerment, and climate change. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's uh, indeed uh, great to be here today on day two of uh, the forum. Nature is uh, declining at unprecedented rates with an estimation of about 44 trillion US dollars of economic value at risk from nature loss. Oftentimes, the climate change conversation is limited to industry, pollution, and people. However, climate change and biodiversity are an inextricably linked. And the more we focus on preservation of Africa's biodiversity, the more more resilient our natural ecosystems will be. A nature positive goal is not some dream to be realized many generations from now. It is a goal for the next decade. What role do local communities play in tackling climate change on the front lines across the continent? We have a panel of experts that will be joining me shortly to dissect all this. I am privileged to be a moderator on this important conversation. I am Naringua Fiona Muthoni. To everyone following us online, thank you for joining us today. You can also be part of this conversation. We highly do appreciate your insights so don't hold back share your questions and suggestions in the comment sections and also later on during the show we'll also get time to answer some of the questions that you'll be sharing with us you can also share on social media let the whole world know what is happening here today you can use the hashtag sankal africa 2020 you can tag us on our different social media platforms. We are on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, as well as Instagram. Our handle is at Sankalp Forum. We look forward to reading your inputs. Without far, much further ado, allow me to introduce our experts for today. We have Charles Meshek. He is a Tanzania Forest Conservation Group. And then we also have Tigere Muzenda, the Regional Investment Officer and Project Manager, SSA, Dutch Fund for Climate and Development at SNV. 
We have Ian Isherwood joining us from WWF Kenya. And finally, Christina Ender, the Regional Climate Change Advisor for Africa at Conservation International. Thank you all for joining us today on this important conversation. Christina, I'll start with you. In very simple times, can you explain the connection between biodiversity preservation and climate change? And to just help create a context of why this conversation is really important. Sure, my pleasure and happy to be here. Thank you for, for the opportunity to contribute and share um, the experiences and broader uh, about Conservation International's work in, in the Africa space. So, um, the I mean, there is a direct connection of uh, protecting biodiversity and um, achieving climate mitigation. Um, of course, one of the key things is by protecting uh, standing forests and, and healthy rangelands, so to speak, um, you are uh, in, in, uh, at the same time um, creating habitat and, and safe space for, for wildlife and for biodiversity. So there is a very specific, clear link um, when you are focusing either on protecting biodiversity, you have a positive impact on climate uh, and vice versa. If, you're, if your focus is on climate uh, mitigation, um, then you also immediately um, by default through nature-based approaches um, have a um, a positive impact on biodiversity. So one of the examples, for example, um, is uh, the concept of Red Plus is reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, it's a it's a way of turning um, is is a way of through the protection of of a healthy ecosystem or or a standing ecosystems. You are you can um, create a, 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 obtain carbon credits and sell those on the voluntary carbon market. Um, and by doing so, you are ultimately generating co-benefits for biodiversity, but also communities. And Christina, just um, we'll be talking a lot and we'll be referring to the term nature positive um, during this conversation. Could you do also elaborate for some of our viewers what the term really signifies? Sure. So in, in essence, of course, we are in the climate, we're in a climate crisis. We, are all, we all know we need to go to a, at minimum net zero. Um, emissions, um, but it, even better, even more important is to enhance um, the resilience of um, of our of the communities and of of nature of the planet itself um, to hold and actually reverse um, the the loss of nature. Um, and so this this is the the approach and the the concept of of nature positive is not just not doing any harm, but it's doing better. Okay, thank you so much, Christina, for that. I'd also like to go to each of the panelists just highlighting um, what is being done in regards to moving towards a nature positive in the different organizations that uh, they are representing. Because, you know, the goal is to have the three measurable temporal um, objectives, zero net loss of nature from 2020, net positive by 2030, and full recovery by 2050. And for these uh, different organizations across the different um, areas of the sector have a key role to play. So I'll start with you, Charles, um, just to break down for us what is being done in regards um, the, to that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Yeah, so there are a couple of initiatives that are being done on the, on the ground. Um, for instance, my organization, the Tanzania Forest Conservation Group, um, has been working with the community to find nature-based solutions. For example, the butterfly farming in Yamani. Yaman Nature Reserve. So we have been working with the communities to see the connection between their livelihood and how they can also uh, get support or get service from, from the forest which they are adjacent to. So this program has been running for the last uh, 10 years, or more than 15 years actually, and uh, unfortunately it was banned in government has to ban all the export of live, uh, live animals. And uh, unfortunately, the butterfly were a part of that. So it is a bit uh, discouraging, but we are still discussing with the government to see how we can revive this, uh, uh, this problem. So uh, that is one part in terms of nature and uh, nature-based uh, linking uh, biodiversity and the communities. Uh, the other part which we are working on is to see the impact of climate change to uh, 
species which are pollinating crops uh, like uh, birds and the butterflies themselves. So there is a study which has been done here in, in the country showing that the climate change actually is affecting the, um, the, these pollinators, the birds and the, and the butterfly, especially uh, the birds which use the, uh, the low, uh, low attitude and uh, as opposed to the high attitude. So they are being affected by climbing up uh, to the high attitude. And that is a serious issues. And this is mostly related to deforestation, which is happening because of the fragmentation between the forest patches. And that is affecting the connectivity between these species from one forest to, to another. So that kind of knowledge is being uh, provided to the communities to make sure that they understand the impact of climate change to the uh, species pollinators uh, so that the communities can take the uh, the right action. Okay, definitely. I'll come back to you to just break down on uh, more on uh, the role that the community is really playing in Tanzania, based off of the research that has been done. Um, I think I'll come to Tigere, you're up next. Just give us a brief um, uh, summary of what is being done in regards to moving towards nature positive. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Uh, so at the SNV, uh, part of the DS, uh, DFCD, uh, we intervene in sectors such as agriculture, agribusiness, forestry, and energy for productive use, as well as water, sanitation, and health. So when you look at all these sectors, they do uh, have one way or the other interaction with uh, the communities, especially agriculture and also forestry. One of the things that we are looking at uh, to be able to move towards nature positive is, for instance, on the forestry side, where the environment is suffering a lot from deforestation. Uh, one of the areas we support is energy, and we support companies, private sector companies, that help produce, for instance, fuel for cookstoves, and these are pellets or briquettes. And when these are produced and sold to households or communities, they help to reduce deforestation because the pellets or briquettes are produced in an environmentally friendly way, and they may be produced, for instance, from uh, fecal sewage, uh, that is sludge from the sewage treatment works, and you don't have to cut down trees. But once they are introduced and used in, uh, in, in cookstoves, they are very efficient, they don't produce smoke, and uh, for that reason, they're environmentally friendly. And that helps to reduce the cutting down of trees, that is deforestation. And they also fulfill a number of SDGs. So in a way, we are helping the environment by protecting it from deforestation. We are helping uh, resilience of the communities uh, so that when biodiversity is improved by not cutting down trees, that helps to reverse the nature loss. That's one. We will also look at agriculture. Uh, we support agriculture a lot. While we may not be able to support individual smallholder farmers, we support them in groups, either in cooperatives or in a way that is uh, through aggregators. And that way we help to introduce climate smart agriculture. And that also in a way uh, helps to improve ecosystems, help to improve productivity of agriculture. And that in itself, when it improves yields, uh, brings about resilience uh, to agriculture, uh, to, to, to climate change, it brings improvement in yields. And as a result, helps to improve this is a resilience of household incomes, and in a way also helps to reduce the nature loss. So some of those areas we can talk about later in detail, but at SNV, we do uh, quite promote the movement towards uh, being nature uh, positive and also improving biodiversity. I was talking about now. Okay, thank you. Definitely we'll touch on that. We'll expound more on energy as well as looking at the impact of uh, smallholder farmers and integration of technology into the agriculture sector. Ian, coming to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Fiona. Um, I'll expand on what uh, Tia was talking about. So um, both of us uh, work within the DFCD. So Tia is an SMV and I'm, uh, as you can see with my background, is a WWF. So I'll touch on some projects that we have done within uh, WWF. Um, I might not be directly involved with them, um, but there are there's a lot of uh, great initiatives. So let's say with the fisheries at the coast. So within the fisheries, um, they've had a lot of uh, challenges, obviously after they've caught their fish, then taking it to a cooling system or refrigerated system where they can then um, sustain their, their, and that, that product. 
now there's great initiatives coming through that are using solar as fridges and uh, freezers so that they can then provide these to these uh, relatively remote areas so that obviously the, the catches are then be, uh, being able to um, be kept longer um, and that's actually helping the community in those areas. Um, other areas that we're looking at is food security. So um, obviously you might know um, across Kenya, we've had a lot of droughts. Um, Kilifi County uh, is one of them that has seen a huge uh, drought. And now we're looking at uh, certain projects that are having um, more drought resistant crops um, or plants that are then being able to be used. Um, and then a community um, are able to jump in or be part of the pro projects. Um, so we're working with a lot of smallholder farmers um, and obviously supporting projects that would be able to support as, mu uh, as many people as possible, not just one or two individuals. Okay, Christina, now to throw it to you. We do know that uh, in the past you have also been working with the reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Just also do highlight um, some of these uh, uh, different solutions that you have been working on and working towards, and to what extent are we seeing the impact? Sure. Um, so one of the Red Plus uh, projects, which is uh, the, the initiative you just uh, mentioned, um, is in the Chulu Hills. Uh, so uh, Conservation International has been supporting the, the development of uh, the Chulu Hills Red Plus project um, now 10 years ago is when we when we began working with, uh, with the landscapes um, and the partners in the landscapes, um, which now spans an area of 410,000 hectares, um, benefited 140, uh, 40,000 um, people and generates 600,000 tons of credits of emission reduction, so carbon credits each year, which um, they are selling on the, on the voluntary carbon market, um, obviously generating um, significant income um, and therefore it can um, benefit both uh, the, the communities um, through social um, support, um, healthcare, education, as well as um, expanding their impact, uh, their protection on the biodiversity, while of course continuing to protect the ecosystem and the forest. Um, addition, another uh, an initiative um, that we are in, uh, working in more in, in the southern in southern Africa, but also in, in an area here in, in Kenya, is supporting the restoration of rangelands through sustainable grazing um, and grazing management of, of livestock and coexistence between livestock and and, and uh, wildlife. Um, and, and again, there is an opportunity to develop um, uh, and methodologies these days to develop these approaches and measure the impact uh, on ca of carbon sequestration uh, or these activities have on carbon sequestration, therefore monetize this as well. Yeah, um, Charles, to so just come back to you, according to the United Nations, it is estimated that about 1 million species are threatened with extinction with the drivers of biodiversity loss due to direct or indirect results of unsustainable human action. To what extent does our action really impact the biodiversity? Oh, I mean, I think uh, a lot. I'm, I'm not a biodiversity specialist per se, but um, I mean, any any loss of habitat has, uh, which we have, you know, see either through um, extraction of fuel, you know, fuel wood or deforestation, encroachment of agriculture um, is is a threat to, to the habitat of the of the biodiversity, and um, therefore immediately has a, has an impact on on the you know ability of the, those species uh, to survive. And uh, we all know that uh, the, the 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 more biodiversity we we lose, the and then the the more threatened we are as well as as a human species. And now, Charles, just to what extent you are with the Tanzania Forest Conservation Group and you've touched on the different um, interactions that you've had with the community. To what extent does our actions and impact um, the, the biodiversity and in Tanzania specifically? Just do draw for us the picture how it is like. Yeah, so the, the, the impact is quite huge and, uh, and in a way it is not seen in, in it is seen in a different way by different people. So my experience uh, is actually um, the threat is on habitat for the biodiversity. So the conversion of the forest habitat to, uh, to non-forest, uh, like agriculture. So agriculture actually is the main driver for deforestation and also a threat to biodiversity. And this is happening in a, in a very indirect way because um, what I'm trying to envisage is that uh, the population is increasing and then because the population is increasing uh, these people would need food um, by um, so by 2050 actually uh, the country is likely the population will double and if the population is double that means 
uh, more food is required. Now the question comes, uh, where do you get the excess food to feed these people uh, by 2050? So in an indirect way, uh, we would need to clear forest habitats uh, uh, so that you could to produce food, unless uh, maybe we adapt smart uh, climate agriculture or we do intensive farming. Or without which, uh, if we are not speaking it now, um, the chance of losing the forest habitat is very high uh, by 2040 or 2050. These forests will disappear because it is not in the agenda of politicians. So that is my worry, actually, uh, the way I see it now. And uh, uh, I, do, I know people blame charcoal, but at the, at the end of the day, it is land, uh, the return from land, that is what communities foresee. So if they can't see benefit from the natural forests, uh, that means um, they are likely to convert uh, forest into agriculture. And it is assured by two things. So once they convert the land, they are assured of the ownership, the ownership of land uh, belongs to that person. Uh, but second, the livelihood, the economic value uh, in terms of whatever they would plant, it would have an economic return. So it's opposed to um, leave it as a, as a natural energy. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Charles, um, just to say to you, so how do we draw a balance? On one hand, we all depend on agriculture. It's one of the biggest contributors to the different um, economies here on the continent, a GDP. And also, on the other hand, we have to conserve biodiversity. And as you said, one of the ways is smart technology. Being realistic, that is not something that uh, many African countries uh, will adapt large scale in the next 10 years. So how do we really draw a balance? So the balance is drawn by uh, first uh, coming up with the scenarios, um, looking at uh, what are the trade-offs. I know we need development, we need, the, uh, we need people to develop. But I think what I'm seeing now, uh, we need to bring a different discipline on board uh, because in uh, most cases we are, we are we are in the boxes, so we are closed in these boxes and we don't talk to each other. So the challenge what I've seen, uh, you have policies which don't talk to each other. Uh, so you have one policy which is right, but when you implement it, it is affecting the, uh, the other policy. For example, agriculture policy, it allows to clear forests, but here we call them in, in Tanzania, if you call it a pori, that means it is a forest actually when you go on the, uh, at the field. So, but in the language of agriculture, it is called the pori, uh, that means it is just a bushland. And in the eyes of agriculture, um, bush forest or the bush is not development. So we needed to make sure that we recognize the forests as part of development, like uh, agriculture. And the other thing, as I mentioned, is the trade-off. We needed to balance. What are the needs now? What are the needs in the future? Because if we go like blind people, uh, it is very difficult by 2040, 2050, uh, to reconcile the two, uh, the, the loss of biodiversity and the impact of, of climate change. So the discussion should start right now, actually, uh, as we move, as the population increases, that is where we could be making the relevant uh, action. Yeah, Charles, um, Christina, I'll throw it to you as well. He says that the discussion should start right about now. We do know that there are half conversations happening around this, but not much is really being done in the policy space. And Christina, I know you do have some background in working in the policy space, especially in Kenya. Just do help us um, understand where are we currently when you're looking at the policy frameworks in protecting the biodiversity in Kenya or within um, Africa? What needs to be done to fast track um, um, just looking at uh, more regulations are being put in place. Thanks, Fiona. That's a very, very uh, important and interesting question. So, I mean, there's there's the biodiversity space, um, and obviously there's the climate space, which has an impact on the biodiversity as well. Um, and fo following the Paris Agreement and following Glasgow um, last year, there is a lot of uh, need now um, and, and actually momentum as well from the government, but also other stakeholders to really develop and create an enabling an environment to, to scale up investment into uh, nature-based solutions that have um, ultimately a climate positive impact, but at the same time will be protecting and enhancing biodiversity conservation. Um, and so actually, um, 
as uh, Charles mentioned, you know, there is uh, often these policies usually don't talk to each other, but um, I've been actually involved in the process and working closely with the government of bringing together these different silos, so to speak, different agencies, different government organizations to come together and talk, um, because that is required in order to harmonize and, and move forward uh, in, a, in a unified manner. Uh, I mean, this that specifically to, to Red Plus and, and, and generating uh, or, or enabling um, carbon projects to be developed on the ground. Um, but that would have to, at the same time, speak and be harmonized, integrated into the national systems as Kenya now and other countries need to be measuring and then reporting back to, to, to the UNFCCC on their achievements towards the, the Paris Agreement um, in, under their nationally determined contributions. And Ian, uh, to just bring you into this conversation, I, I know you are in the investment um, space, investment landscape, but there's only as much someone can do unless there is really a conducive environment that is enabling. So from your experience, when, um, how enabling would you say and how attractive is it when you're looking at the investment landscape into um, this particular space that we're looking at? Um, so what I would say is that it's uh, extremely exciting because there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, sometimes the funds and the different programs that are um, that come across from certain places such as Europe, they might not understand the local landscape. So the local landscape is, is very important for us to, to start giving that feedback. So working with the DFCD, we're constantly looking for a certain criteria that we can fit in and we can scale these companies. So we have a, a threshold of roughly 5 million euros that a company needs to be able to uh, scale to over the next three years. Now, as you can imagine, that is quite a lot of money for some landscapes. So when we work within the Sopnot region, which is the south of Kenya, north of Tanzania, it's very hard to identify those kind of um, companies or those kind of projects. However, with us giving that feedback and coming back and forth, working with the WWF, working with other partners, we can then create other smaller funds that will be able to come in and then support and um, these smaller initiatives. So they might be more community focused, et cetera. So uh, overall, I would say that there are lots of opportunities, but what we need is more, um, more opportunities for the different um, levels of um, companies and projects out there. So some might only be for 100, 200 people. Uh, some might be able to scale across different landscapes and each one of them needs to have an equal opportunity so that we can at least see them grow and give them that opportunity to skill up, I, was, I would say. Yeah, we do know that over the years, conversations on climate change has been picking up and we're also seeing different uh, financing tools that are coming up. Um, Ian, just to break down for us, what financing opportunities are really there for within the African continent? Financing opportunities. Well, there's a, there's a lot of support out there from different organizations. I can definitely speak from uh, DFCD. So what we do is well look for promising projects that have the potential to be able to scale and to be able to at least uh, see revenue over the next uh, potential revenue over the next few years. Um, then we'll support those through grant funding at the initial stages. Those grant fundings will be able to just get the project into um, a suitable and attractive position that we then attract the private investors. At the end of the day, what we're looking to do with the DFCD fund uh, is attract private investors, because we understand that when private investors come in and see the value of nature, then there's more chance of us being able to protect it and actually um, give more hope to the communities around those areas. Yeah, um, together, just bring you into the conversation. Ian has said that the majority of the things is uh, looking at attracting private investors and bring them into the space. Um, I want you to help us gauge and understand uh, what does it really matter to businesses? I mean, what, uh, the, what role can the private sector play in uh, looking at uh, providing the different um, opportunities in the climate sector space, whether it's also um, biodiversity? Um, is there space for the private sector players? Is this an area that they can really tap into? Uh, thanks, Fiona. Indeed, there is space for the private sector and the, the whole mandate of the DFCD actually focuses on supporting the private sector uh, so that when the private sector is supported and uh, they are commercially viable, they'll continue to deliver the benefits impact that we expect them to. As we have seen like in 2020 and 2021, when one depends on uh, donor funding and a, a, an event like COVID comes in, the funds are diverted from assistance in, in companies 
to humanitarian assistance. And as a result, companies suffer. So we support companies that are potentially viable so that if they're able to stand on their own, they can then continue to deliver the impact on jobs, on uh, women empowerment, uh, on, on, on uh, the environment, uh, and resilience and sustainability. So we have seen quite a lot of uh, uptake, uh, especially in Kenya and East Africa, of the DFCD funding. Uh, when we look at agriculture, we know that agriculture supports uh, close to 70% to 80% of the employment. Uh, it also contributes plus or minus 25% of the GDP around Kenya. Uh, so as a result, this is an area that we really want to support. And some of the support we've come up with, as Ian has indicated, is to first of all say, at the beginning, the company suffers because the, maybe the, the, the shareholders are constrained on equity. And for them to meet all the early stage activities that they want to meet, it's a challenge. We come in with a grant, which helps to meet some of the early stage costs. When that is done, we help to de-risk the project and make it more attractive to financiers. As a result, the financiers will look at it and say, oh, there's less risk because some work has already been done at origination by the DFCD, and they are willing to lend and provide funding. The funding comes in the form of debt, uh, largely from the land use facility with FMO, um, and this supports agriculture, agroforestry, and energy. On the other side, there's also funding that comes in the form of equity, uh, especially from our funding partner called Climate Fund Managers, and this supports activities in water, sanitation, and health. And if a, an activity or a, a project requires more than the threshold that the company or the financier is providing, they're also in a position to mobilize third party funding. As you may be aware, the DFCD fund is 160 million euro fund, but the 160 million is a small amount compared to the demand that is out there. So the mobilization of third party funding is then coming in to say, if FMO reaches its mixed ceiling or maximum threshold, they can turn to their lending partners and say, we need more, and they can come to the table, lend on the same terms and conditions. The same applies to the equity side. If what is required for a WASH project is more than what climate fund managers can provide, they are also in a position to mobilize additional funding from their lending partners or investment partners so that we can then bring to the table what is required by the project to provide the additional funding and meet uh, the funding needs in that respect. Yeah, Tegere has elaborated further on the different financing tools available here. Um, Ian, I also want to bring it back into this conversation because um, I, I do know that in one area we are in kind of a startup boom. You know, we're seeing more young people are being empowered to get into the space of creating their own opportunities. Are we seeing a bigger appetite going into the climate um, climate space? And uh, to what extent do you see scalable projects that are coming your way? And just do break down for us and do break down for us what has been standing out, what stood out for you in regards to these uh, different projects that are coming up? That's a very good question, and and I agree. Um, sorry to you, um, I, and, and I agree that there is a lot more money coming in, and it's, it's super exciting. And I come from a business background, in essence of having startups, etc. Um, and ten years ago, the amount of money that we are seeing pouring into Africa now is is incredible. So that's something to be super excited about. But at the same time, there is a there's a lot of problems, in essence of as uh, Charles has mentioned, we're doubling in size in Africa. Um, that means there's going to be food security, food shortages. We need to be able to come up with solutions and smart solutions working with nature that will be able to uh, attract private investors, attract entrepreneurs. At the end of the day, a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes are not too nature based. And I'll say that having been in that space, they're very focused on they see numbers. So they see Africa doubling in size and all they see is how can I sell to them and, um, and you know, uh, re reap the rewards. Now, there are a lot of people seeing the opportunity to create smart farming, smart food practices, um, looking at alternative food. So right now, obviously, we know from um, there's a lot of uh, Africa's a, a meat eater uh, country. So how do we get the protein? Uh, we're looking at, well, not uh, we're looking at, but there are opportunities out there that are from um, insect protein. Let's call it that. So insect protein is uh, globally getting a lot of attention. Uh, and that's super exciting because you don't need a lot of land mass to be able to produce them. And, and they're, very, uh, they're very, very high in protein. Then we're seeing other opportunities at the, along the coast where, as I've mentioned, there's a big drought, but there's great opportunities for these drought resistant uh, crops that are able to grow pretty much anywhere. 
communities can then grow them and then be able to um, sustain themselves better than they can currently, whilst also uh, driving business along that way. So there's a lot happening. Sorry. Yeah, as you say, yeah, Nyamachoma is an absolute favorite for especially people here in East Africa. Charles, to throw it to you, just still looking at the financing mechanism, what are the financing gaps that you're seeing in this space or that you're in in Tanzania? How big of a gap is there? And are we seeing investors really ready to get into this particular space? Yeah, so we are seeing the, some discussions which are going on now, uh, especially through the banks, uh, the, the Sierra DB Bank. Um, has been now credited to GCF uh, to, and it has received, I think, some funds to support the small farmers so that they can get loan. So the discussion involving the private sector is now um, part of the development partners. Uh, so as NGOs, we work on the ground and we are linking our initiative with the private sector for sustainability. And especially when it's uh, supporting the organic farming and also coming up with certification of these uh, crops that they are being cultivated or being produced in a sustainable way. And, uh, and in the lens of the private sector, and at least the NGOs and the development partners supporting the value chain. Uh, it, it might not be the whole value chain, but uh, um, we are at least identifying the, the the part of the activities which the NGOs can can support. So I see the uh, the discussion now coming up. And uh, recently, I was discussing with the the French development um, uh, organization. I think um, so. They are also looking at uh, working with the civil society, but also private sectors, which are uh, which which are responsible for uh, protecting the environment. Uh, basically, uh, one of the principles of this bank is to exclude the uh, activities that cause deforestation or damage ecosystems or pollute and exploit nature. So uh, putting those kind, kind of conditions to, uh, to the borrowers who want um, money from the banks, I think it can also raise the understanding between nature and, uh, and, uh, and development. So I'm glad that discussion is being uh, thought uh, through the three pillars, the government, the private sector, the civil society, uh, without forgetting the local communities. Yeah, and would you say all players are keen to actually participate in this? Because also looking at the community um, space, is there really knowledge on uh, the extent that um, our actions have when you're looking at uh, the smallholder farmers, when you're looking at uh, the different uh, local communities that are practicing fa farming or uh, fishing, subsidiary fishing? Do you think that... Uh, the knowledge has already reached to the grassroots and knowing that actually my actions have a consequence to the environment. Where are we in regards to that? Yes, they, I have to accept the knowledge, the solution is there, um, but it is being implemented in a patchy way, in patches. So I think the issue is scaling up these solutions, uh, which we, uh, still is a bottleneck in our case. So the solutions have been identified and uh, and the communities are being implemented um, in some areas. So if we scale up, for example, the issue of climate smart agriculture across, across the country, we are likely to reduce the, the impact of converting uh, the forest in habitat. So even if we introduce the sustainable fishing gears, we're also likely to, uh, to, to reduce the impact of our fishing. Even the issue of pollution, uh, like stopping, for example, in the country, we have now stopped the using of plastic bags, which I couldn't imagine people just adapted like that. And uh, and now you don't see people throwing um, plastic bags um, uh, in the street. So at those kind of um, initiatives, which people link uh, why they shouldn't do something because it affects the other. So basically your action uh, affects the other action. So if people understand, um, and so as long as that knowledge is there, and um, I believe I think we can, we can succeed. And so through using media, and I think I can see the media also, uh, they are quite involved in providing that kind of knowledge. Um, so it's basically changing 
uh, the knowledge from our head and uh, putting that knowledge into practice, uh, not yeah. only for a small area, but also increase to, uh, to large, uh, large areas. That is where we can have uh, meaningful impact. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Christine, I'd also like to, um, uh, to bring you in into that conversation if you have anything to add on to what Charles has said. And we have also had the smart technologies, the word being thrown around. To what extent are we seeing adaptation here in Africa or even in Kenya? Do you, when you're looking at the ecosystem, whether it's in agriculture sector or fishing, are we really ready to adopt and, uh, and just work with uh, these new and emerging technologies? I, I think I think we are. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, as you said, uh, Nairobi especially is a hub of startups and 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 um, green green ventures, and um, so uh, there there is a lot of uptake um, um, and and possibilities. Of course, I think it takes time for for those to be really fully integrated and and, and taken on by communities. And um, obviously, there's a change and a possibly some resistance for some communities maybe to change from one certain way of how they always used to cook to uh, to a new more sustainable cook stove for example um, but uh, so I think we, we already uh, there, there's there's uh, there's a uh, great uh, opportunities and, and and movement in that space um, I just wanted to in terms of just adding on to the to the opportunity of private sector I wanted to just add that um, I fully agree with what everyone has been saying. Um, there is a lot of there is a need, and there is a, also the recognition that we need private sector to to come in, and and they have the funds ready to deploy. They really are, they are so keen. We've seen the shift, uh, the shift from just uh, as, as Ian mentioned as well from a few years ago to where we are, in, like two three years ago to now, especially coming out of Glasgow as well. There's so much money out there wanting to be invested. Or these private companies want to invest in in nature um, and and um, uh, climate mitigation and, and adaptation. And so that is really an opportunity that um, I think governments are aware of. Uh, speaking from the Kenyan government, they are very conscious and very want very much wanting to 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 ensure that their enabling environment is there for private sector to invest. And they're very much aware that they also need that additional funding to to achieve their their respective um, you know targets, national targets, but also uh, to to reach their their goals under the nationally determined contribution. So, um, given that there are conditional and unconditional targets that each country has on, in their NDC, so um, that is a very positive um, uh, uh, move and 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 an outlook. Um, to, to make sure that there are a lot of um, private sector to, to invest in Kenya and Africa. Yeah, um, Christina, you've touched on uh, Glasgow, uh, would also look into that. But what I wanted to ask, is in there a kind of a dislink between um, the urban cities, you gave Nairobi as an example, as, um, as well as uh, the grassroots area where all these activities are really happening from? Because when you look at uh, the literacy skills, it's also relatively low. Um, uh, whether it's also digital literacy skills, they're also still relatively low. And uh, when you look at um, even you've touched on Glasgow, um, the outcomes that came out, some were not really excited as they were not at par with expectations, but do the decisions from whether it's uh, COP26 or whether it's um, uh, different uh, government institutions have a bearing on the local communities in grassroots area? Would it, it be better if uh, change was happening, let's say from bottom up instead of top down? So I think, the, there, the this time at the uh, in the COP twenty six, there were two uh, big changes that that we realized that we, it was very notable. One is that nature was really center stage, or had much bigger presence and acknowledgement of playing being a key part, a key sector, the land sector in in for all countries for us as a global community to be able to reach our global goal um, of of one point five right or two two degrees. Um, so. Um, that was one one big change from the previous COPs and the discussions before, when nature was more on the sidelines. The other one is that the, the uh, local communities and indigenous peoples' voices were very clearly heard. They were very loud, very strong. There has been uh, commitments made to lifting up and supporting indigenous peoples' uh, rights and therefore and 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 ability to play to contribute and play part in these climate discussions and and therefore and, and also be able to. Um, 
or their rights being acknowledged to, to receive the benefits from it. So that was another big change. So I think whilst there was like, there obviously some limited uh, uh, or, or reserved sort of outcomes, like it could have always been better, but that was definitely a po two positive changes that we've seen. Um, and in terms of the disconnect, yes, there is obviously um, on, you know, between the communities and government central uh, uh, governments and, and local and people working in the capital cities. Um, that is that, it, that is true. That is still um, in the reality, but that really requires then to have and and I and again just speaking from from our point of view and our my experience, there is a, the acknowledgement that we need to build the capacity, reach out uh, to all different st uh, stakeholders um, and especially in the indigenous people and local communities um, to explain what is happening, what what are the opportunities and what they need to be also aware of, like um, there is currently a lot of uh, scoping going on of these projects of investors. And if the communities are not um, well uh, educated or you know aware of what the implications are for them to enter into a project, that obviously could result uh, uh, in, in, in you know, uh, possible negative impacts if they are not very well prepared. So um, that is, yeah, that is uh, something. But in, in, in essence, um, there, is, there is a need, there is a gap still, yes, but there, there are uh, actions um, planned and, and taken to really um, improve and build the capacities of all stakeholders in this space. Yeah, um, together just to, to come on to you, if you can uh, piggyback off what Christina is saying, the capacity, is it really there? You are talking of, earlier of an on adoption of uh, smart technologies. Uh, to what extent is this being really integrated into the ecosystem? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Fiona. I think uh, Christina said most of the things. At COP26, it was agreed, for instance, that there should be a 10-year work program on action for climate empowerment, which is focusing on advancing climate education, training, and public awareness. And this also brings into uh, the play the smart technology that may need to come along with the climate education and training. Um, there was also an agreement that they should be uh, put in place building blocks uh, for a review of the gender action plan, um, and that this review will strengthen the implementation of the gender action plan going forward. Uh, she touched on local communities and indigenous peoples. Um, there, there is work that has already been done in the last two, three years, uh, which was again recommended that it should continue to go uh, forward. And an area that was also touched on was uh, ocean and land. Um, I don't know if Ian touched on this, but there is also a, a, a concerted uh, effort to introduce uh, activities that touch on the ocean and the land. For instance, um, seaweed farming. And we know that seaweed has got a lot of applications in cosmetics, uh, in, in medicine, in, in uh, animal feeds. So all that needs to be taken into account. It's not so much a bottom-up approach, but I think there's a need to incorporate the uh, local communities at the same time that we're introducing new technology, uh, new ways of doing things, new methods of farming, so that they are not left behind. If we look at doing a bottom-up approach, uh, there may be a gap created to say, oh, so what happens uh, for those that are already away ahead of the, of, of the local communities? So we need to take them all across at the same time and look at what it is that can be done with them. One of the issues that is critical for our regions, uh, for instance, is uh, indicated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, they indicated that Eastern Africa is going to suffer uh, a lot on extreme flooding events whereas Western and Southern Africa are going to suffer largely from uh, drought events. So when we look at adaptation, we need to look at this region and say, what is going to affect Africa uh, in, the, in the East and Africa in the West and Southern, and therefore what needs to be done because there are going to be impacts on animals, on livestock, there are going to be impacts because of rising sea levels, there are going to be water and the dry conditions which may lead to desertification. So what adaptation mechanism do we need to put in place? So it is context specific in a way. Uh, it shouldn't be a one, uh, like, like one size fits all. We should look at the context and the impact that is coming to each area. And then we structure the relevant intervention for that specific area, depending on uh, impact coming across.
uh, Sophia. Please. Yeah, um, Charles, just seeing off from what Tigera is saying, do you think that it's possible to achieve um, a net positive by 2030? What needs to be done in order to just um, make sure that we get there real quick? We fast track the adoption. Two things we have to do. Uh, first is to preserving and restoring the natural environment. So we have to to put that in the agenda to make sure that we we preserve at any cost and the restoring all of the natural environment. So without that, I think uh, um, um, we face a big challenge actually. Second, we have to mainstreaming biodiversity in all our sectors. So by mainstreaming biodiversity in all our sectors, uh, uh, for example, uh, excluding all of the activities which are uh, leading to deforestation, we have to stop those ones, maybe also improving the risks and the controlling the, the projects that are affected by diversity and, uh, and they use the, uh, the nature, the nature-based solutions um, to make sure that we, uh, we do that in a sustainable way. So if we go in that way, we are likely to achieve the uh, SDG, the 2030. Christina, bringing you in, do you think that we are likely to achieve this particular target? What can we do to fast track um, the adoption? Yes, uh, I, I mean, it, it will be a challenge, uh, but I think with all, if we are able to join forces and ensure that there, you know, we, we get the, 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 we have, we, we are able to um, use the, the, all the funds available from private sector, from bilaterals, um, so that that will uh, facilitate that we can reach the target, uh, but it, it will it will be challenging. And of course, you know, with the with the pandemic, with uh, political um, events, that might also you know those are additional hurdles that we we are facing, and it's very much a reality that we're all living uh, today. Um, but the the great thing, I'm, I am I'm very positive, as I said, the, the change we've seen, the the commitments we see from governments, we see from the private sector to, to net zero and nature positive are there. Um, funds are being pledged and now we need to see that those funds are actually um, being, um, be, being um, generalized and actually then deployed to the, the areas that most need them. Yeah, and Ian, to what extent would you say the pandemic has really impacted um, uh, looking at the financing space? Are we saying, because uh, we know different economies are still uh, grumbling and trying to really find their footing back. Um, so are we seeing investments, uh, taking a, investors taking a step back or is it uh, still moving at uh, the pace it was pre-COVID-19? Um, I would say it's actually increased. So uh, the money flowing in is uh, the, the COVID, as, as terrible as it is, is actually highlighted um, how important nature is to us. And um, maybe being in our staying in our own countries and being locked in lockdown, uh, we start to appreciate nature and we start to appreciate what we have around us. Um, and that's really highlighted um, through the funding coming in. So now actually more money is coming in, more funds are coming in. Um, but I would say in argument for what Charles and Christina have actually said, I'd say for us to, to reach the, um, the targets, we actually need bigger policy changes. And the bigger policy changes, it starts from the top because there's a lot of unsustainable um, uh, businesses out there that are really, um, those are the ones really coming in and uh, using fossil fuels. They're still using a lot of uh, unsustainable um, fuel um, fuel. Um, yeah, ways of, of fueling their, their business. And, and that way, we're looking at businesses to try and uh, find alternatives. So as Tigez already said, from the brickets, et cetera, those uh, can come in and uh, offer an alternative. But I'd say definitely there is a, a lot of money flowing in to the sector, uh, but we need more. We, we fall $2.5 trillion short each year um, to reach our SDGs. So there is a lot more, but obviously that's what we're looking to do with the uh, DFCD and uh, attracting those private investors, bringing more and more uh, bankable nature solutions. A lot of people talk about nature-based solutions, but we need more bankable nature solutions because that's when we can actually make nature sustainable in the long term. 
Yeah, um, to get it to just bring you in, um, uh, Ian has touched on the importance of finding um, alternative solutions, whether it's energy and just uh, looking at the way COVID-19, in a way, it has provided a positive outcome for uh, financing in this particular space. Looking at what is happening in Russia, Ukraine, and looking at oil prices are going over the roof. Do you think that this is actually the right time to start investing aggressively into more sustainable energy um, energy space? Hi, Tigera. Yes, yes, uh, that is you. Do you think this is actually the right time to yeah. be aggressively financing um, uh, the sustainable energy spaces here in Africa? Hey, thanks, Fiona. Sorry for the, for the gap. Uh, yes, it is the right time. And I can give a very good example of what the DFCD uh, has done in Kenya. Uh, whereas most uh, water treatment plants are, are, are fueled, say, from uh, fossil fuels or from the grid, uh, using using um, the electricity from uh, hydro hydropower plants, we we now have uh, a project in Kenya that's going to help people in semi-arid and arid areas uh, whose boreholes have got high levels of salinity and they are not able to use much of that water. What has happened with the project that we we supported is that the the technology came in and it can be installed at a borehole. It is operated purely by solar where the solar power uses, uh, uses the machines uh, to draw water from a borehole. It moves the water into a storage tank. It uh, purifies the water using solar power and the water then is stored in another tank after purification, which can then be dispensed to consumers. So in this case, we've completely removed fossil fuels. We've also done an independent uh, water treatment plant, which is independent of, of the, of the uh, grid, the hydropower grid. So in that respect, we think we can continue to introduce more of such independent power systems, uh, which, which uh, like if, if there's going to be a shortage uh, and of, of, of oil and therefore high prices, we can help alleviate that using solar power. We can also then use uh, solar and, and a hybrid of wind, uh, or we can use wind systems on, on their own. And in that case, we completely remove uh, the, the, the fossil fuels. In the homestead with uh, pellets and briquettes, we can completely remove the use of kerosene, uh, which is a fossil fuel. So there is uh, that opportunity to now be more innovative and look at what it is that we can use as an ad adaptation mechanism to move away from what is being problematic and where prices can easily rise if there is a political disturbance. Sorry, political disturbance, like what is happening in Russia and China and, 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 uh, and, and Ukraine. So this is the right time. And I think innovators should be called upon to, to, to do that. Uh, lastly, in the cold chain, in the uh, vegetable and fruit production in Kenya, we know that there's a serious loss, post harvest loss, because of movement of product from the farm gate to the market uh, on open trucks, uh, which, which, which run through our roads. There is now uh, an innovation which is coming to Kenya, a project again supported by the DFCD, where the cold chain is purely supported by solar power. Containers, 40 foot, 80 foot containers are converted and uh, installed with uh, cooling systems that run on purely on solar. So the farmer is now able to harvest their crop because this is a mobile container which is put close to the farming area. The farmer can now be able to harvest their crop at their leisure and if it is stored in a chilled container, two, three, four days, before it is moved to the market. As a result, there is very little uh, post harvest loss, and also the farmer is not forced to sell at a poor price, fearing that their harvest may be lost. So these are some of the innovations that have come in, which are already operational, and we continue to think about what it is that we can do and introduce uh, to help the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you together for your insights. Um, we are running uh, close to the end of uh, this particular panel discussion. I'd like each of the panelists to just give in their final words, closing remarks. What is your key takeaway from this conversation? Um, what challenge, what call to action um, do you give to the person following uh, this conversation? Charles, I'll start with you. Yeah, so the main one which I I foresee is to bring the different sectors uh, together. Um, and I believe the different sectors have different solutions based on the nature. So the understanding in terms of how things connect to each other, the ecology of it, I think it would be very important in terms of networking and how different action will 
uh, would be opaque to uh, one year chain. And the most important here, I think, is the is the business is the usual scenario, which we have to avoid it. Um, uh, and that means we need to look on the legal governance. We need to look, look at the standard which we are producing in our crops. And also we need to make sure that we, we, we involve the communities. We shouldn't leave behind the communities who are adjacent to the nature. They should be part of the solution. Thank you. Um, I, I similar, similar to what Charles said, I mean, there's a need to really um, bring everyone together we have a very uh, ambitious target as a global community to, to reaching our climate goal and our uh, the sustainable development goal goals and, and, and stopping uh, hold the, the loss of biodiversity. But there is, as we mentioned, there is, there is uh, momentum, there is uh, funding available. And so I think for anyone tracking this conversation specifically, it is to making sure to, to get informed um, to get informed about all the policy implications before jumping into a, a certain uh, project um, and, and committing in, in the long term, um, because that will that will, there are changes uh, uh, needing to, to take place as from from the carbon perspective at least, um, and and uh, yes, very much ensuring that it is a an inclusive uh, you know uh, uh, gender equity and social inclusion is being considered in all of the projects that are. Um, and an initiative that anyone is, is, is taking on board. Okay, thanks, Christina. Um, Tigere, coming to you, you actually have a question. Um, we're coming in from uh, Chloe. She's asking, what are the costs and competitiveness of these solar solutions in relation to traditional ones that use fossil fuels? Um, you can answer that and then also give your final closing remarks. Okay, uh, thanks, Fiona. The systems that we have experience with are quite uh, competitively priced and operationally um, efficient as well because you, you then don't have um, maintenance, significant maintenance cost. I can give an example of the solar uh, powered water treatment system, which has a 60% cost saving on operations because now you don't need to, to, to buy spare parts frequently. You don't need many people to be running around buying fuel and uh, running the generators. So there's a 60% cost saving. That uh, for sure is there uh, as far as we've seen in the, in the solar treatment system. Um, so the same goes with, um, with, with the uh, cold chain. There's that uh, saving because in Africa, we are blessed with uh, constant sunshine and that gives the, uh, the make sure the system continues to run. Even when there is, it is cloudy or it is raining, once the system is powered, it can run for a further 36, 48 hours uh, on solar before uh, it, it runs out of energy. But we can support that by having batteries um, already charged uh, so that it can pick up when the, when, when the solar generation is, is weak. So it's, it is beneficial and it is commercially viable. Then to round off uh, on, on the closing remarks, I would say that what we need to do as financiers from our side as well as policymakers from the other side, is to promote uh, climate smart agriculture. We have seen that in Kenya and other African countries, there is a medium to low adoption rate of climate smart agriculture. Yet, it is that which touches on many other ecosystems and has a potentially significant impact on the environment. So we need to promote that and ensure that there is increased adoption. Uh, funding is generally available uh, through various mechanisms uh, and also models that can be used to generate that funding for those that need it. So we are available to talk uh, on what it is that a, 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 an operator may need and we can find uh, a solution for their needs. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, everyone. Um, so what are my takeaways from today? Uh, obviously, um, climate change is real. Um, we're feeling it everywhere uh, in Kenya. We've had wildfires up near Mount Kenya. There's wildfires across uh, in, in uh, Australia. And, and there's, a, there's a bigger need for us to be able to protect what we, we have around us. So what I would encourage and what I would uh, want to see more of is more of the entrepreneur mindsets, not focusing on maybe the tech and uh, elsewhere, but really focusing on nature and using those skills to be able to uh, create the problems that will have a huge impact in, long, in, the, in the future. So um, I would encourage everyone to, to look around you um, and see how you can become a a lot more um, sustainable with your business and even try and adapt better practices. 
Um, so that's my takeaways for today. And I would also encourage everyone to join us on Thursday for a DFCD session uh, where we'll dive a little bit deeper. So if you are looking for support, or if you are looking for a uh, better understanding of bankable nature solutions, please do join us. Okay, thank you so much, Ian, for the invitation. And uh, thank you so much to all our panelists for today. Key takeaways from today, more financing needed in order to just uh, be able to achieve and fast track a nature positive by 2030. Uh, we need uh, bolder policies from uh, the policy, um, policy spaces uh, to just create a more conducive environment. We need a uh, faster adoption of smart technologies and, um, you know, and more and more that has really come out from this conversation. This has been a crucial conversation to be having especially at a time like this um, we have come to the end of this panel discussion but definitely not the end of the forum and for a change to happen we must have such conversations that highlight the gaps that are there and what needs to do to be able to achieve sustainable um, development you i was uh, your moderator for today fiona mothoni naringwa and i'd like to thank our panelists on the call we had Charles Meshak, he's from Tanzania Forest Conservation Group. We also have Tijere Muzenda, Regional Investment Officer and Project Manager, Sub-Saharan Africa, Dutch Fund for Climate and Development, SNV. We also had Ian Isherwood from WWF Kenya. And finally, Christina Ender, the Regional Climate Change Advisor for Africa Conservation International. Thank you all for your time and the insights that you have shared with us. I hope everyone had a fantastic day yesterday. And thanks once again to our discussion today. Really, really appreciated all the insights that you all brought out. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank, um, to thank our partners, our team, and our leadership to our partners like IFC, Bayer Foundation, Japaigo, GIZ, Energy Catalyst, DFCD, Energize Africa, DRK Foundation, KCJF, Moringa School, and many, many more partners who contributed to this event. You helped us drive conversations and collaborations to address some of Sub-Saharan Africa's most pressing challenges, and we appreciate your support. To the Sankalp team, George, Margaret, Orvashi, Naomi, Ambika, Alan, Mike, Kelly, Kanishka, and to all of our colleagues who have supported us in making Sankapa a reality. Sankapa is truly a team effort. Thank you for your energy, your humor, the late nights, and most of all, thank you for your passion to make a difference. To our CEO, Vikas, thank you for always steering us in the right direction and your unwavering support, especially when planning an event during COVID, which has definitely been our biggest hurdle yet. Last but not least, thanks to you, our participants. This community makes Sankalp such an incredible platform. Thank you for sharing your insights, for being open to collaboration and for mobilizing change. I have no doubt this community will change the world and will drive significant progress towards the sustainable development goals. We still have lots of incredible sessions happening today, tomorrow, and there are still plenty of opportunities for networking. Uh, we will leave the networking platform open for you until next week, so please do keep the conversations and meetings flowing. I hope you continue to have a fantastic time at Sankalp, and I look forward to meeting many of you in person on Friday at the Kenya School of Monetary Studies. Enjoy the rest of your Sankalp. Rachel, back to you. And thank you to you, Ariel, for steering the group and guiding us through the craziness that is Sankal um, Africa Summit. We, uh, we thank you, as, as Ariel has mentioned, and just a, a few uh, quick reminders. We still have amazing sessions scheduled uh, for the rest of the day today and tomorrow. Some of these sessions that you should definitely look out for include women's economic empowerment through a low carbon recovery, Beyond Urban Cities, Investing in Kenya's Future Green Growth Hubs, De-Risking Women Farmers Through Innovative Insurance. Some sessions planned for tomorrow include Developing Green Climate Solutions Towards Investment Readiness, Mental Health and Wellbeing for Founders and Startups, and Innovative and Sustainable Fintech Solutions that will drive the future of Africa. Our in-person gathering, as Ariel has mentioned, is at the Kenya School of Monetary Studies this Friday, 4th March. We look forward to engaging and interacting with you more on the day. Keep tweeting and tagging us on all uh, our social media platforms. Wishing you a lovely, lovely day and the rest of the summit. Goodbye.